Before we start today's show, today we want to give a big shout out to Buzz TV. Man, Buzz TV has some some really really good devices, man. Like this last year, um, they've come up with some good stuff, and this new year, whew, I'm excited to see what they got. Yo, it's gonna be straight fire. Some devices and features, because I don't want to say one or the other. With Buzz TV, it's hand in hand. They've dropped some fire devices and some amazing features that are always uh, taking things to the next level. Uh, we also have been in talks with Omni Labs Robotics, bringing their telecommunication devices and robots to the next level, bringing everybody closer together. Yeah, absolutely. These guys, their, their telepresence that you get, um, is very, very cool. If you guys don't know what telepresence is, is having a pretty much a robot in front of you where you are remoted somewhere else. And it's, it's like you're there physically, but not really physically. You're there through the vote robot. It's very, very cool. Uh, make sure you guys check them out in the description below. Make sure you guys do check out that link. Talking about devices and, and streaming and all that stuff, you also want to make sure that no matter what you do online, you stay protected. Um, there's so many VPN services out there. We talk about all the time. Make sure that you guys try them out. You check them out. See which ones work best for you. Absolutely. Make sure you guys do check out those VPNs. Um, we do have a couple of them that we recommend in the description below. So make Make sure you guys do get those get, get just get protected guys so don't forget to check out the description below for all of these guys that we have shouted out today you know no matter where you guys are listening watching whatever from make sure that you guys hit that subscribe button that like drop us a comment and the reviews actually help us a great deal if you're looking to do anything for us in <laughs> this year coming um, and beyond the reviews help other viewers like yourself find this podcast and enjoy it as well so thank you guys and with all that being said let's start the show And welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Streams. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, I don't know if you want to call them myths, of the best HDMIs out there. And <laughs> you have to have silver, gold plates better, more electricity or copper. I don't know. There's just so much There's so much stuff out there. And, and I, I know next level, we've been, we, I, I, I want to say we almost get challenged a lot. Like, how do you know that's the best one? It's like, well, <laughs> kind of well, looks good. <laughs> or, or they say on the other side, uh, an HDMI cable is an HDMI cable, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's actually, that's like exactly what we get. They're like, hey, my, my $1 20-foot 4K HDMI cable at 120 whatever is the best cable better than your audio quest at a hundred and some bucks. I'm like, okay, look guys, <laughs> I don't know about all that, <laughs> but we had to bring in an expert. <laughs> so, um, today we have, uh, Jeff, um, uh, from, uh, it's HDMI.com, right? HDMI licensing. Yeah. HDMI, HDMI licensing. Um, so if you can give us a quick intro of who you are, what do you do? Um, that way the audience gets a good feel of, uh, of who you are. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks again for having me. So uh, my name is Jeff Park. I'm CTO at HDMI licensing. So HDMI licensing, uh, short, we call ourselves HDMI LA. So that's short for HDMI licensing, uh, administrator. So what we do is we, uh, we are the creators of HDMI technology. So. Uh, it's not just a cable, but it's a whole suite of technology because it goes into devices, displays, you know, source devices, game consoles. So we publish the specification. The specification is a, a series of documents that tell manufacturers how to build HDMI stuff. And then we also publish test specifications. So what we have is called compliance test specifications. And that basically requires, every, so within HDMI world, if you build an HMI product, you have to get it tested. It's not an option. There's a compliance test requirement. So that compliance test tells the manufacturer how to test. So everything from cables, connectors, all the way to giant TVs. Right? So uh, we do this to ensure that whether you buy you know, Jeff's TV 
or Rolex TV or Next TV, it doesn't matter. They all work together, regardless of the brand, regardless of the manufacturer, because they're all building towards the same specification and they uh, are tested the same way. So that, that's what we are. And that's uh, what we do is one of the main things is to make sure that uh, products have compliance. So if there's any issues, we investigate, you know, to take any appropriate action, uh, work with the manufacturer if necessary. Not everybody's a good guy, right? So we do have to put the hammer down sometimes. We actually do work with um, Customs and Border and other government agencies to seize products at the border if there's any problems, right? So uh, those unpleasant stuff I don't like to talk about, that's let my compliance guys deal with that. <laughs> you know, talk good, good stuff with you guys, so. It's it's so interesting when we think about HDMI, it's so much more than what the average consumer understands about it. Because it's not just the cable, like you just said. It, yeah. It's everything in regards to the devices that's sending the signal through yeah. the cable and the device that's receiving that signal, right? Yeah. What does it look like when we're having these conversations and how to communicate? I guess you have a certain standard of HDMI that every device has to communicate with. Like, how do you how do you create that into an understanding where those companies have to have it at a certain specification? Yeah, I think the key is to have a clear understanding and and definitions, right? So of like, okay, so when when two devices connect, there are a series of things that needs to be done, and those series things that needs to be done not are only specified within the uh, specification documents, but are actually verified. Because the manufacturer says, oh, I'm the best at making something. Okay, that's nice, but we want to also trust and verify, right? You hear that all the time. So I think that is a key component to kind of HMI success. And I think to your point is that people don't even think about the complexity. And that means we're you know, doing our job, right? Because at the end of the day, regardless of how great the technology is, but if it's complicated to use, no one's going to use it. Right. So with HDMI, um, you know, now with HDMI 2.1, you're pushing what 48 gigabits now uh, of bandwidth. I mean, that's like Google Data Center in the backyard, right? I mean, that's like crazy in terms of numbers. I mean, as a geek myself, as a nerd, I'm like, that's crazy numbers. But my mom doesn't care. My wife doesn't care. Plug it in, it should just work, right? Regardless of all the features that's in there, all the complexity in there. I mean, I'm a PC guy, PC gamer, so I love to nerd out about all the, you know hardware and little changes here and there to overclock, give me 10% more, you know, those kind of things, most people don't care. And I think HTML was created with that kind of mindset in, in trying to build a technology and deliver experiences without having to, people even think about it. Just they, they see the cable, plug it in, it just works. And that's our, our ultimate goal, so. Yeah, so, I mean, if, if I'm thinking about computer monitors, for instance, right, we have certain cables that yeah. are specifically for video. And then yeah. if we look at, you know, optical and stuff like that, HDMI is able to deliver both digital video and audio, right? And it has right. to do it at such a high transfer rate. Um, yeah. When we look at HDMI, how long has the, that, that cable been around? Because it's, it's fairly new when we look at all the other cables that are on the market, right? Uh, yeah, there's some truth to that. So physically, the cable looks exactly the same from since 2003 when we first launched HDMI back in the HD days, HD TV days. So mm -hmm. it physically look the same. The connector, everything doesn't change. However, the requirements for the specification and the, the amount of data and the testing requirement has gone up significantly. So while the physically looks the same, but the amount of testing and, and the construction of it has changed significantly. So what that means is when HTML was first launched, uh, in terms of raw numbers, the bandwidth required to pass through that co copper wire was about five gigs. Mm -hmm. Now we're at 48 gigs and you, you, you can't ask a five gig cable to pass 48 gigs. It's right. I mean, you might get lucky. I mean, you might have a cable guy who built overbuilt their cable back in the day and then it works <laughs> theoretically on paper. I can't argue against that because in theory it's possible, right? But the reality is, you know, everybody makes it just enough so they can pass the testing, right? Because they want to save costs and, and manufacturing and whatnot. So, now what we have is when we first started, we had the HDMI cables. And then what we launched, um, you guys remember PS3? PS3 mm -hmm. was one of the first ones to have like deep color, like 10 bit color and just uh, 1080p and just you know that generation of stuff. And that's when we doubled the bandwidth and that was 10.2 gigabits. And that's when we re uh, released um, a new t type of cable called high speed cable. So high speed cable, or again, tested higher, physically looks the same, backwards compatible, there's no physical change, but again, tested and constructed uh, with higher quality. And those testing requirements, those specifications were used for those cables. And now uh, move forward to when uh, HDMI 2 was released, 
Uh, then we started having 4K60. That's when 4K60 came out. And then we had premium HDMI cables. So the premium high-speed HDMI cables were the next generation cables. Again, physically the same, but higher testing requirements. Now, uh, fast forward to today with HDMI 2.1, now we're pushing 8K, 4K120, and, and the next, next level experience. So when, in conjunction with that, to support those higher bandwidth up to 48 gigabits, uh, we uh, updated our spec and released the specification for what we call ultra high speed HDMI cables. So ultra high speed HDMI cables now are certified. And if you go to HDMI.org, there are um, ex explainers on the cable. And anybody who's interested can go to the HDMI 2.1 section. Um, and if you check, check, check out the cable section, uh, it's like scroll down a little bit. Um, yeah, go to specification at the very top. Yeah, and then go to uh, uh, yeah, uh, two dots. Yeah, and then overview on the right. Yeah, and then scroll down. See right there. So all mm -hmm. it, it, ultra high speed HDMI cables are now certified. So what that means is, regardless of you know who you buy it from, they will have this label if they've gone through the full testing, and it's it's a pretty stringent testing for cables. So every length. Um, every model or whatever it is from the manufacturer, if they've gone through the full compliance testing and certification, then they would have these labels. And these labels are quite unique in that, theoretically, I mean, you can copy it, but if you look at that shield, that shield is actually a hologram, if you look at the physical label. And so it's a combination with that QR code and that, that holographic seal, it's registered through us. Manufacturers can only get this label through us, and we did that to ensure that uh, to minimize the counterfeit, right? And to ensure that consumers have the best experience because no longer are we pushing like five, 10 gigabits, we're talking 48 gigabits, right? So the margins of errors are very, very light um, because uh, honestly speaking, back in the day, I mean, you can probably get away with hand soldering a cable uh, to get 10 gigabits, you know, if you get, if, I mean, if maybe half the time, right? So a lot of people may not even realize, right? That they had a bad cable because they weren't pushing the limits. Now we're getting to a point where we're really pushing the limits of what a copper cable can do. Uh, so now we ensure with this program and the labeling program that cables are actually certified and that we can uh, track that too. Because we do auditing and making sure cable, you know, they don't just test one cable. That's perfect. What we'll typically in the industry call it golden sample. So they have one golden sample. That test is passes and then all of a sudden they change the design, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. We've seen that too, right? So. In order to keep the manufacturers honest, I mean, most of them don't do that. It's, it's the questionable ones with any industry. There's always, you know, bad apples, right? So that's why we also do a market audit. So market audits are we randomly buy cables and test them to make sure they, they actually do what they say they're supposed to do, right? Especially with these ultra high speed cables. Um, and so far, um, you know, manufacturers and have been releasing these slowly. Um, and some of the cables are already bundled, um, right? So depending on your device. So, but these cables are kind of what we you would need going forward to really push the envelope in terms of uh, resolution and frame rate. So, with this, that with that little sticker right there, um, yeah. what they what what anybody can do, what I can do, any any consumer out there, they could just grab their smartphone and with the camera scan it, and then it will tell you if it's a legitimate ultra high speed cable or not. Oh, uh, yeah. So I, I, thanks for bringing that up. I totally forgot to mention that we have an app, a very simple app that just scans and then pops up the names and manufacturing uh, ensures that uh, the uh, the cable is legit, right? So uh, there's the HMI uh, QR code app and then just simple app. It's not, I mean, people who want to scan it, they can do that. Um, and it will bring you to the HMI.org uh, information page about that cable, right? So to ensure it package and the labeling actually matches up with what you're buying, right? So um, that's also an option. And we work with, you know, uh, retailers and other guys to make sure that they, it's mostly for them because they want to make sure that whatever cables they get into retail, because we don't want to have to have users like constantly verify everything they buy. We prefer it to that they never get a chance to even buy fake stuff, right? Or, or non-tested non stuff. So that's why we uh, mostly focused on uh, retailers, distributors to make sure that whatever they have in, on shelf or in their warehouse is actually legit and they use that app uh, to verify that, right? So mm -hmm. uh, that, that system is in place. Cool. So um, I guess what makes a good HDMI cable then? Uh, well, first of 
first make sure it's passed all the testing. So for so it's, there's different different perspectives, right? So from our from my perspective, it's all technical. It, it's mm -hmm. black and white. You pass the test or you don't. It's very simple. If you pass the test, then you'll meet all the uh, specification requirements. You'll support all the features uh, up to the limits of spec. Having said that, you know, I mean, like overclocking your CPU. Yeah, you buy a CPU, and some CPUs are better at overclocking than others, right? So theoretically, mm -hmm. those are more valuable than others. I mean, so I've, I've seen, just like everybody else, I'm not blind. I mean, I've seen the cable guy saying, we could do more than 48 gigs, or like we could do 10K or 15K, or future proof, yeah. whatever. I'm, theoretically, that's possible. So I can't, from a technical side, since theoretically it's all possible, I can't say what they have or have not done because I haven't personally verified it, right? Uh, but when it comes to cable, you also have to think about like, you know, you uh, like a $10 cable versus $100 cables. There's many differences. So if they're both certified, right, from a technical perspective, they should deliver the same thing. Uh, however, so having said that, you know, five ten dollar cable, anything goes wrong, you might be SOL, right? Mm -hmm. No support, no return policy. They, the stores disappeared after a week. You know, all, I've seen all kinds of crazy stuff, right? So mm -hmm. there's that aspect. There's the other aspect I was kind of talking about with friends, whether it be your PC or anything. Some people like to flex, right? So gold and silver plated, maybe that gives them value. Technically speaking, yes, in theory, they may deliver the signal better, but if the both cables have been certified to meet the standard, then they should be delivering the same thing. But there's other things like like the higher price cable, a lot of times they're way better constructed, like especially if you're going to run it through walls and stuff like that, pull it through walls. I know for sure like cheap cables will fall apart very quickly um, because mm -hmm. of construction. So that's one. Some people like to show off their cables for whatever reason, right? So I've seen people doing like crazy stuff on their wall with cable runs. Um, so maybe they won't do that, right? Or they, they're they doing a heavy bend, right? Because if your TV's tight against the TV wall or your wall, then you might need a bend, right? So there's a lot of variables. So it just depends on the consumer. And I think that's the benefit of a, a, a HMI ecosystem as well, because consumers have choice, right? So they have the choice to decide whether, you know, paying a lot of money for a brand that they trust and that have longevity and warranty and all that is worth it versus paying maybe a lot less for a cable that may not may have support if you have problem, right? So uh, I think there's two aspects to it. So the technically speaking, if they're both, they actually meet all testing criteria, they've actually really passed it, then they should have no difference in delivering the experiences you want. Uh, but once you start moving into other things, you're looking for other aspects of the product, not just cables, just products in general. Um, then, you know, that's, I think, a lot of variables. I mean, there's go always going to be guys who fancy up any product. I mean, you can get an iPhone for $1,000, you could pay $100,000 if you want to bling it out and then start mm -hmm. flexing diamonds and whatever, right? Uh, and so it, it just depends. And so I think also there's a lot of cables also coming out that you'll see that are what we call active cables. So what that is, is they have active electronics in the chip. So you'll start seeing these cables that are all try to be cable that are active. So what that means is you can have very thin wires or even very long wires, like some have optical inside. So that means you can go like a 200 feet or maybe you're running a projector on the ceiling and you need like a 50, 100 feet. Those will be pretty pricey, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of things and cable from a consumer perspective is pretty simple. It should be just wires playing in it. A lot of times the cable itself may look like a regular cable, but also might have active electronics in them. So. Um, is that yeah. like an amplification somehow? Uh, yeah, some, it's kind of like that, but also they do conversions. So they have the ones that are really thin that are optical in between. They would do uh, um, conversion to optical. So it's converted from HDMI to optical, then optical to HDMI again on the other end. And mm -hmm. those are typically, I, most consumers really don't need that unless you do long runs. You want to run wires through the walls all over the house. That's uh, good to know. And something like that. So. So you did bring you did bring a good, a good point, which I was kind of like thinking about this um, when I when I started to really dive into like cables, like cables matters. You know, it, it's I, I've, I've tried a lot of cheap ones. I've tried the ones that got big names without naming them. <laughs> you know, um, they became popular, got a big name. Um, and then I even tried some that that people really didn't hear about and now they're starting to make a really good name because they have some great quality stuff. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I never really <clears throat> like, okay, an HDMI cable will pull out that video and audio and 
the one thing I started to do probably actually I would say with the, when when the PS4 first came out, mm-hmm. I was like, I need to start using uh, optical optical a dedicated optical cable along with my hdmi cable um and and i ended up getting um like you know these surround sound speakers and i got this really good tv and i'm like i want the full shebang the whole experience you know um so i guess i guess i i know the the audio on the audio side the optical it gives you that dedicated line does it does that free up any kind of anything from the HDMI cable to push more power? Um, does it do anything extra for you when it comes to the HDMI by having that dedicated line? And what more do you actually get with that dedicated line versus just having the one HDMI cable? Yeah, so for from an HDMI architecture perspective, the video, you can call it lanes, video lanes, audio lanes, and what we call uh, metadata. So it's like information exchange lane. They're all parallel. So one not being used versus the other, you're not going to really impact it. Uh, so that's not an issue. And one thing you got to realize, when you use optical, you're limiting yourself. So optical is very limited in terms of bandwidth, uh, in terms of audio. So it's limited to basically the same bandwidth as two-channel PCM, which is equivalent to fitting Dolby Digital, the original Dolby Digital, uh, and DTS, the original ones. Now, with HDMI, you can go all the way up to 32 channels of PCM or do Dolby Atmos, Dolby Digital Plus, Detail. I mean, all, all of them. Basically, there's no limit when you do HDMI because you got such a high bandwidth for audio. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I can see optical being convenient depending on your setup. But now, with most TVs, you have what we call um, eARC, audio, an enhanced audio return channel. So basically, that allows, so if you plug everything into the TV, and then you have your surround sound system plugged into, say, one of the HDMI ports, it can actually send the audio in the reverse direction. So from the TV to your surround sound system, and you don't lose anything in terms of, uh, of audio formats or audio quality. If anything, you gain the maximum available. And so whether which so the point is, regardless of which direction you're sending the audio, within the HDMI world, you have uh, in, almost uh, no limit in terms of audio quality. It, now the limitation is your hardware, what your hardware can do, right? So. Um, what I always recommend is try to run everything through HDMI whenever possible, especially audio, uh, because the fact that you're going to get the best experience. Uh, PS4, for example, running through H- um, you know, uh, HDMI, you get W Digital Plus and all the benefits for higher quality. Even some of the titles, you can you don't even need that. If you have just speakers dedicated with an amp, uh, you can theoretically just have the PS uh, output the audio uh, decompress it basically right into um, surround sound, whatever you want. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility depending on the devices you have. Um, and so for maximum compatibility and, and maximum quality, you know, HMI is the way to go. Uh, and you're not going to, it makes sense, right? Thinking that audio might take up some of the bandwidth, but it's not the case. It's a dedicated pipe just for audio. We ensure that. And so that can be used whether the video is, you know, top notch or not. It really has no impact on audio video side of things they're independent Uh, so um aside from i guess the amount of bandwidth a cable can push or a device can push what other criteria are you guys looking for when you're certifying um, hdmi devices besides bandwidth yeah so when it comes to actually devices there's a lot of things involved so when you most people don't realize when you first plug in devices they actually communicate with each other so if i plug in a ps5 to a, a you know modern tv they'll plug in and start going down the list of capabilities, saying, I can do you know, 8K 60, 4K 120, 12-bit color, I can do H- all this HDR formats. Just hold on the whole list to communicate. And the source goes, OK, let me let me look, check out your menu item here. <laughs> and then decide what he can send or not send. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of smarts involved. Again, users don't have to think about it. Users don't care. Users, most people don't even know about it, which is one of our goals, right? Don't, don't care, don't know, it just works. So it's a lot of things that go on in the background. So when you plug in devices, they start communicating um, all those things, and then they, you know, start negotiating basically the what we call protocol, right? So there's protocols involved on um, having to send uh, the actual packets of data, whatnot, how to send it, what the configurations are. So there's a lot of technical details that work out 
uh, and all that thing happens, you instantly plug in. So all those things. And the devices are tested for that. And beyond that, we even get lower level in the, in the testing. So what I mean by that is we actually text, test the electrical. Like we send the signal electrical and decide what the pattern looks like. And it, it goes way, way beyond just um, like actual bits. It's actually looking at even lower level. So actual electrical signals and making sure that whatever electrical signals, whether it be cable um, or the devices themselves, the electrical signal going in or out to make sure it has what we call patterns and 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 the, and um, uh, a structure that it needs to have in terms of the actual electrical signal, so that we know it'll work. Um, make sure voltages and all those things match up, so that you don't plug in one device and plug in another one. You know, have problems, right? So, or, or even a spark or whatever. So, all those things are involved in it. Um, so, we go from very low level all the way to you know the protocol and actual a user um, device interaction level. So it's pretty comprehensive, and again, required for every device, every manufacturer, every device type uh, to ensure that you know every manufacturer, regardless of the brand, you don't have to buy the same brand; they would work together. When we talk about signal, like you guys are testing for the actual signal, I see a lot of the high-end um, brands, let's say, uh, talk about their shielding. Now, is that is the signal, is that directly affected by the shielding of the actual cable? Or is there other things that affect the signal of an HDMI cable? I mean, you can have, so with anything electronic, um, you can have interferences from other devices, theoretically. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what's most important is like, if you don't, every almost every, every electronic device will have some sort of shielding. And depending on how it's set up, if you have like a bunch of ports close together and then you have your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all that kind of all close together, then yeah, it's, you can definitely have a uh, potential impact on one or more of the devices. So it could be it, the, a lot of times you see this by like Wi-Fi interference and other things like that, where wireless kind of craps out for a little bit. Um, so it's definitely theoretically possible uh, to have those kind of situations. Uh, and shielding is important, but again, it's such a variable because it's so dependent on the design. So you can have the best shielding and you can kind of promote that, but that might be because it's just your design, the way you design it. You have to have that kind of um, shielding for whatever reason. And another guy may not have as much shielding because they designed it very differently. And that might not require as much shielding and, and protection. So um, there's many variables to that um, because there's also you know, power supply. Uh, Power supply, depending on how it's set up, can also impact. So, uh, for, but purely from HMI perspective, um, what we call EMI interference, that's also tested as part of the cables. Um, so that's it, it's already accounted for. Um, but again, even even having said that, the individual devices would have to kind of ensure their design is you know uh, well shielded as well. Cool, super cool. So, man, okay, with the shielding. Um... A lot of people, I, I I like calling it a rat's nest. Everybody's got rat's nest. Yeah. <laughs> um, cables everywhere. How do you know, I guess, when you get this interference between your Wi-Fi or, or these other cables that when everybody just tosses everything, is there something within that, that barcode that people could scan or something that we should look out for that says, hey, this will, this will prevent that interference between the other cables? It's it's hard to say. Well, the test is to ensure that the HDMI cable doesn't add to whatever you already have. So, in theory, it's if you have a rat's nest, I think it'd be very difficult to pinpoint just uh, one right away. You would have to just go through the list and start checking out different cables, uh, depending on your rat's nest, right? Because once you have a rat's nest, I think there's too many variables to say, oh, one HDMI cable is going to solve that. I, I'm 99% sure. Even if, if you have the perfect HDMI cable that's like surrounded by iron, if you have a rat's nest, you most likely have a, a other problems uh, that are being introduced um, into that particular setup. Because, you know, a lot, a lot of the times, if you have like an HDMI stick, like Roku stick or Fire TV stick, mm -hmm. you stick it in the back and then you have a rat's nest, it might not even be interference. It might be physical interference where you have all these copper wires covering up your and uh, blocking your uh, sticks. So that's why Wi Fi is crap. Right, so it just it's very variable uh, depending on the user. But what I always recommend is just to not block physically block like devices with your cables because a lot of times they have rat's nest. Like you have a device 
top shelf and then a second shelf that's like completely covered uh, mm -hmm. with all these cables and shrouds and whatever. Uh, and that uh, can, regardless of what devices maybe have a higher uh, EMI or interference, uh, it's, it's going to cause ha havoc with your wireless signals, right? So uh, that's just, just the nature of the setup. I've seen some pretty bad rats nests. I'm guilty of it too, you know, over the years it builds up, right? Um, and yeah, I've ran into that too, but it's more because just wires and cables blocking, physically blocking your devices. And the most recommend, you know, for especially for the sticks, because that's most common, you know, try to use that pigtail. They usually give it a little short cable. You can plug it in and kind of, you can have it dangle down instead of being yeah. close to it. Yeah, uh, you can do stuff like that uh, to help it. Um, and it's best to avoid rat's nest as all as possible. And you know, with with HDMI, most people are not going to run into those kind of search bend. I mean, uh, the HDMI specific problems because you're only using one cable at a time. So the chances of having like massive interference is you know almost non-existent. Um, so, and, and the way these devices are built and most of them are pretty, you know, they're all, all high quality and it's in their best interest, right. To have good shielding, to give be uh, best experience to the user. So, so with, uh, I, I hate rats nets cause it's, 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 it's just pure chaos. I, 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 again, I, I think I, I want to say I started to do a lot of my changes and research with what's good, what's not good. Um, when the PS4 landed, um, and so I'll, I'll give you a little backstory. Um, PS2 came out, and it's it's still the the best selling console of all, all time. Like that, the PS2 just changed the game big time. Um, every game that they had that came out was just blockbuster. Yeah. Um, and when the PS3 came out, um, you know Xbox Xbox was still pretty new. Right. um ps3 for uh then then came out and they were still making games for the ps2 and i'm like why am i going to get a ps3 when the game is on the ps2 i'm like i don't need a ps3 so i actually i skipped that whole generation i didn't touch the ps3 i was leaning on getting an xbox just to try something different and then nintendo had to save the day with their nintendo wii yeah. <laughs> i love that thing i still love that thing the nintendo yeah. wii is awesome and um, so I, I ended up getting the Wii and when, when they were, you know, Xbox one and PS four and I was like, Oh, let's see what's happening with Nintendo also. And then Nintendo Wii U I'm like, why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I had to do like this just research. I'm like, let me just look. I'm like, I, I, I skipped the whole generation. They're not making any games for PS2 anymore. I'm, I've been playing on the Wii more than anything anyway. Um, so when I started to really dive into it, I was just like, cool, let me just get the PS4. Everything looks like it's going to have what I wanted to have. Um, and the one thing I started to do with, with, with going back to that rat's nest was how can I how can I clean up my cables? So when I go behind my TV, it's not like I'm, you know, pulling, you know, all kinds of stuff everywhere. Like what's this, what's this and yeah. dust and dead cockroaches. I don't know what's back there. <laughs> so, so what I did was I started to get, um, I started to get these, uh, what is it? Like a uh, Velcro, like foam. Uh -huh. um, and I would just, I would just Velcro it. And, and what I did was I, I was very, very specific with my cables too, even in the back. Like if I, if you were to see the back of my computer, um, cause I'm, I'm running three monitors and I'm running, I'm, I have like a big setup here. Um, I try to have the cables that do the same things together. Hmm. So all my HDMI stuff went together. All my opticals went together. I let my, I put my Wi-Fi cable separate. Um, anything that was connected through uh, the internet, I actually bundled them together and made sure they st they stayed together. For I, I guess my question now is for to optimize everything so that way you don't get interference. Is that a smart thing to do, or does it really not matter? Most consumers not going to matter. Um, to be honest, I mean, unless you have like rasness, like I said, physically blocking stuff, you're rarely going to run into Wi-Fi issues. Most 
I mean, I'm not a Wi-Fi expert, but I mean, I've dealt with enough problems with uh, wireless in general. Most of the time, you're gonna have uh, interference with your neighbors if you have neighbors. That's what I've experienced personally. Um, and a rat's nest, yeah. I mean, if you're gonna like, especially with those thick and small devices that have physically small antennas. But if you have an external antenna, you run a wire to it, especially like on desktop, for example. Uh, it's going to be pretty rare uh, to to have that, but it's it's always a good idea. But overall, your technique is good because you want to run network separately as much as possible. I always recommend that uh, networking should be always separate, and then you can bundle everything else. Uh, and you shouldn't run into problems, but if you do, then you can start trying to separate and to try to figure out what's going on, right? Because you might have a you know, defective cable or something. And a lot of times, it may not even be shielding; it might be just bad soldering job or something. The wires you know, not making good contact or whatever, right? So, um, yeah, from my experience, that's not really going to make a, a big impact. It's just a good idea, but in general, it's a good idea to run the networking separately. So we've we've talked a little bit about shielding and about bandwidth, but what else makes that big difference when we plug in that dollar store HDMI cable versus a high quality cable? Because we can see the difference but why can we see the difference? What's causing that difference? Is it because of the bandwidth? Is it because maybe the dollar store HDMI cable is pushing five gigs versus the 48 that the more expensive one is pushing? Or what are the factors that are really coming into play that we can see on our TV screen? So when you say we can see, I, I really don't know what that means because I've heard users say, well, this cable looks better than the other cable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, I mean, I guess if one cable is physically working better, you can have situations where your cheap cable that's probably not certified is barely pushing the bits together. So you got your basically what that means is with any data throughput, your error rate starts increasing. And there's a threshold where it's too much error, then you get a blank screen. But if there's not enough errors, then you get a screen. But there's this small window where it's like bad but not bad enough to get a black screen so you can theoretically have like what, what i call uh dancing pixels okay. it, it looks like little dots like randomly um but it's not like analog so a lot of people think i still have the analog mentality where if you bought back in the day components or video analog cables and one was physically better quality than the other then you actually see quality difference right because it's analog that's not really true for digital because digital basically you send the data and it's like reconstituted on the other side uh, and you know accounting for errors and whatnot. So it, it's hard to say that you know if you're gonna see better picture quality by cable. I mean, unless the cable itself was designed for that, because there are cables that actually have even more active electronics in the cable itself mm -hmm. that have video processors and all that in the cable. And I, and some manufacturers, you know give you that option. Uh, but in most cases, I mean, the cable, especially if it's just a dumb copper wire, uh, it's, it's and assuming they're both certified, they should deliver the same picture quality. Uh, unless, again, the cable you bought, the cheap cable you bought, is, they say it's certified, but it's not really, right? Because it's right on that border um, and you're getting not as good picture quality because you're getting higher error rates uh, but not enough to fail, but enough to see those dancing pixels plus potentially. Um, but I haven't seen, like, I've gone through millions, of, or maybe not millions, but hundreds of cables myself, and I've never seen picture quality drop or increase just by changing the cable. Uh, again, being certified, right? Again, every, everything being equal. Um, but again, just because you bought a cable and it works doesn't mean the next 50 guys is going to work. That's another thing I always tell people. It's like, yeah, you can buy a cheap cable, you might get lucky. But unless you know for sure it's certified, it's hard to say that, yeah, that cable is going to work. And even, even if you buy any product, not just cables, you're going to have quality issues from time to time, right? Because they're stamping out these cables tens of thousands of, at a time. So, yeah, even if you buy from a good brand, yeah, you might run into a situation where it's not ideal, right? And you, and you need that support and whatever. Uh, but, yeah. When it, when it comes to everything being equal, regardless of the price, and they're technically, physically tested and certified, then there shouldn't be any difference. And because the biggest difference is the devices themselves. Devices themselves make uh, sending what they're supposed to send uh, and, and ensure to do that. And a lot of the modern devices as well um, may have uh, capability to kind of not really fully test, but just kind of spot check whether the connection 
the cable and the connection itself is um, good. Uh, so they may deem that the cable, for whatever reason, isn't meeting the error rate. So they may send lower, you know, lower uh, video resolution. So you might even not realize you're running at 1080p. You thought it was a 4K. Then yeah, okay, you can see that happening. Um, so that that's that's theoretically possible, but from a technical perspective, cables being the same, certified, everything, it should deliver the same performance. But if they're not certified, then they may not be hitting that minimum of the five gigabyte or 10 gigabyte or 48 gigabyte that a typical cable is for, right? And that's where people could see a drop in in the bit depth or no? Uh, no what, what would happen is, I mean, if you buy like a real, like this year, if you buy TVs and devices, then yeah, they could, some of them should be able to automatically, you know, bring you down. Uh, theoretically, I haven't seen them uh, personally, so I'm not, I can't speak for that. But mo in most cases, if you say, I want 1080p six or 4K, 120 or 4k 60 coming out of my device to my tv and your cable can't do it you just get a black screen hmm. it, it's that and that like i said if they're like right on that small band where it's fail or possible but they're like that little white band that you can have maybe not really snowing but you can have like dots uh, or the picture goes in out in out right you're playing all of a sudden 10 minutes in you picture cuts out and then comes back so those kind of situations that means your cables probably right on the border of compliance uh, probably didn't pass compliance or it could be just a manufacturing defect right because that happens too but uh, that means your cable's right on the border and those situations are uh, i've seen before but if the cable physically can't support what you're trying to do you just get a black screen so man okay so i got two questions i'm gonna ask the first one for the first though <laughs> so okay with some of these streaming devices like the Fire Stick, the TiVo, the 4K Chromecast, whatever you have you that's out there, they have a built in HDMI cable in there. It's just it's just the HDMI end and you just plug it yep. in. Yep. Um, do those have to go through some sort of uh, certification also? I, I don't think I've ever seen that sticker on 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 a on a fire stick box so i guess how do we know for sure that that hdmi is going to be a good one so th those devices that's a good question because those devices are not um technically cables right they're actually devices that just happens to have a plug uh cable plug so they're actually in the hdmi spec called direct attached devices so direct attached i know clever name right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> direct attached device and they go through testing like a device plus some uh, special testing for the connectors and whatnot. So they do have testing for that. So those kind of things, they don't, they wouldn't have the cable certification because they're not cables. They're not passing anything, right? Right. right? Yeah. Because cables usually receive on one end and pass it through the other end. So it wouldn't do that. So they're again treated as direct attached devices and they go through the testing. And so with, with not just direct attached, but with any HDMI product, the official HDMI logo is what represents that they went through compliance testing. So if you go to HDMI.org, you see that top left corner, uh, that logo basically means it went through compliance testing. And legally speaking, they can't use that unless they met all the compliance requirements, right? So our compliance team, like I said, uh, would take action against anybody who's trying to sell stuff that are not, you know, legit. Um, so uh, that's how they do it. And those devices go through the same testing um, uh, for, for HDMI uh, and, and, yeah, that's how you would know. If you look at like a Roku or a Fire TV stick, it will have the HDMI logo somewhere on the box or on the list. Cool. So that that leads right into my second question. <laughs> so I, I guess I guess I, this is this might hurt me more than it's going to hurt some people, but I want to debunk a couple things. So we have a copper, silver, gold plated platinum gold pl whatever <laughs> whatever the cable is everybody goes through their through the, your certification process and passes so i guess for the end user for us who are out here saying like oh you know silver is better because it transmit easier oh no, well gold's better because gold's worth more than silver whatever it is <laughs> is there is there really a difference between the different types and if there isn't if there isn't much of a difference then what benefits are we really getting out of these different types of elements i guess 
I'm not a material scientist, but from an HMI <laughs> perspective, if you use gold, platinum, I mean, unicorn hair, I mean, it doesn't really matter as long as you meet all the certification. And yeah, I mean, I mean, and to be serious, I mean, yes, I guess you can theoretically maybe with a test equipment and measuring equipment, say one material is better than the other. I, I don't know. It's probably theoretical because, you know, it's electronics and electricity. So you can say, you know, gold, silver, or copper, or whatever, they all have different um, characteristics, right? In terms of electrical signals passing through. So yeah, you can probably measure that, but we don't measure and like say what material is better than the other because it's the whole system, right? So we just test the cable and make sure it passes through regardless of the materials. And maybe some manufacturers can have their own internal development and test say, hey, this cable can do more. That's great, but the HMIs could do this, right? So, you know, I mean, right now, some people claiming to have like future knowledge is kind of questionable at best, right? Because no, there's nothing, we haven't announced anything. We haven't um, talked about what's next and what's gonna be in the spec. And I personally don't, I personally know there's nothing written yet, right? So that's ready to be published. So, you know, some claims are questionable, um, I guess. Technically speaking, if you're talking about just electrical signals and saying I can pass 100 gigabits or 200 gigabits, yeah, I guess you could just pipe just bits and say I can do really high stuff with my unicorn laced cables. But <laughs> at the end of the day, from an HMI perspective, HMI world, it's really ensuring your cables meet the specification requirements for cables, especially it'd be certification, the ultra high speed. And anything beyond that is really what you're looking for uh, in terms of cable quality support, you want to flex, I don't know, whatever it is, right? So <laughs> a lot of it is peace of mind. I mean, like certain things, yeah, it, it, there's durability and other things involved as well, right? Because it's not just about uh, the cheapest cable possible because some cables, if you're going to do plug and unplug for a while, you might need that durability versus my TV. I don't remember the last time I unplugged the HMI cable after it was plugged in, yep. right? So uh, it just depends on your needs and the materials, yeah, in theory, it can make a difference, but if they all meet the standards requirements, um, you know, some of the talk about future proofing or whatnot, I mean, that's theoretically possible. Uh, but again, I, I can't speak to the future and what, what we're going to require on the cables, uh, whether and whether, you know, platinum or gold can meet that requirement, you know, e years down the road. Mm -hmm. So, talking about future proofing um there's been a lot of different i guess versions of hdmis over the past little while and we had um two and 2.1 but there was one there was 1.1 1.4 and it went all the way up right so when it comes to those versions of hdmi um do you guys implement the next standard of hdmi or do you guys get presented by the companies with the innovation and certify it how does it work and how does that process work? Yeah, so there's a, actually, a, uh, that's a great question. There's a group called the HMI Forum. So that's, you can think of it as our R&D department, right? So that's a group, um, if you go to hmi.org, you'll see a complete list of companies. And the hmi.org, uh, hmiforum.org, sorry, hmiforum.org, there is about 80 companies that work together. So this, this group was created just before the release of HMI2. So the, for the creation of HMI2, the, HMI founders, as we call it, the, there are seven companies that created HDMI originally from HMI one. Uh, as we, you know, after 1.4, they believed, you know, HMI got so big, we should open it up to everybody, right? So created HMI forum, it's an open organization, any company can join. And so these companies come and they make proposals within that group. So within that group, uh, you know, we, I myself and our group also provide feedback and, and, and see what's next and try to help with that. But generally these companies come together and try to add things to the spec. So it could be one company or group of companies that want to add a new feature. And then the forum as a whole work together uh, to create the specification, the testing, everything involved. Uh, and then that, that once they agree upon how to do things for that particular feature or advancement, um, so we get added uh, to the spec and release. So to that zero, we added, you know, 18 gigs, 4K60, uh, uh, eARC, and a few other things. Um, and then with 2.1, we added, you know, um, I'm sorry, 2.1 was when we added eARC, but, you know, advanced features um, to go along with that. So those get added 
so yeah, I mean, it's a collaborative effort and the industry wide. So if you go to HTML.org, I mean, there's pretty wide net of uh, companies. Uh, everybody from you know, giants like Intel and Samsung down to small connector guys you never heard of. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of perspective. And I think that really helps HTML because it's not just one or two or 10 companies who are you know big guys that want certain things. It's right. across the board uh, that really helps the industry as a whole. I was going to ask, so then what's the future of HDMI looking like? But if you got a forum of 80 people that are throwing ideas together, I guess that would be a very hard question to answer. Yeah, I mean, right now, because right now, I think I, what I can tell you is, you know, HDMI 2, I mean, it, just HDMI in general, regardless of what's next, we're always improving the testing. So test equipment, testing procedures, and test spec, that's always being developed. So that's something you're going to see more and more going, going forward. Uh, because now, you know, we had HDMI 2.1 features on the high end for a while, for many years. But I think this year, especially with the release of the NVIDIA AMD and the consoles, PS and PS5 and the Xbox mm -hmm. uh, series, I, I think that really broadened the market. And if you look at a lot of the CES, uh, CES announcements and presentations, I mean, they're bringing some high features down to uh, pretty affordable prices, right? So. Uh, and I think that the consoles really force that because you can buy now a $500 console that's capable as RTX, you know, a couple of years ago, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I think that has really helped. And I think what this year is going to entail for 2021 is that more wide availability. Uh, hopefully you can physically get it, but that's a different issue. But once it's physically more available and you can actually get your hands on the console or whatever, now you have a lot more choices uh, for you know, surround sound systems or um, TVs or anything else, monitors that you want to take advantage of, uh, you can see more of that. Uh, and beyond that, we're still discussing um, because we're trying to see what's next. And but, you know, I think uh, the whole pandemic situation also slowed things down because one of the key kind of uh, uh, things that we expected to happen was uh, the Ch Japanese Olympics last mm -hmm. year was supposed to be broadcasted in 8K, like fully. Mm -hmm. like, they all prepare for it and like, you know, up to like, I think, AK 120 frames and just crazy stuff, right? I mean, hey. <laughs> they, were going, they were going all out and then everything got stopped, right? So a lot of things I think could have benefited from that because I mean, whether AK was like mass adopted by consumers, but you can't really have that chance until you actually see it, right? Because when it comes to like TV technology and broadcast technology, a lot of people only think about the numbers, right? 8K, 4K, mm -hmm. whatever, but it's not just that because once you start adding that, everything around it gets better too, right? Because when you buy a TV five years from now or 10 years ago, it's not just resolution went from 1080p or 720p to 4K, the glass got better, power supply got better, processors got better, the little pixels got better, even the plastic mm -hmm. around it got better, I mean, everything got better, right? So I think that was kind of culminating into that, you know, not to say that was the only thing, but that was kind of like the starting point, the catalyst that everybody expected uh, to kind of help drive some of the innovations. Uh, but unfortunately, that never happened. And it may not happen now from some of the news I've read. Um, so uh, I think, you know, that kind of slowed things down. But I think, you know, once this pandemic kind of improves, uh, we're going to see, you know, we're going to internally look at um, what to do next because you know we're looking out further but our assumption is that pandemic will be you know all over and, and fears from now we'll have something new but uh in terms of you know talking about what's next i mean we'll see that's under discussion and uh, but for this year i'm just very excited because as a gamer i think this is the year of gaming i think a lot of the manufacturers are focusing on gaming which is great you know even the tv guys uh i, I, I always talk about like they're actually shrinking their tvs and adding high-end features to their small TVs. Because if you remember, if you go to any Best Buy or Target, the small TVs have nothing. They're like the mm -hmm. low end that had no features. Even if you wanted a smaller TV for your bedroom, or whatever, you can't get it because, I mean, you could get it, but you would lose out on all the features because you would have to get like, at least like a 55, 65 or whatever to get all the advanced features. You know, when, <laughs> when I was looking at getting my Xbox or the PlayStation just came out as well, and I went into Best Buy, they would say things like, people are coming in and they're buying monitors instead of TVs for the faster refresh rates and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, and for sure. That's, that's what happened is that's forcing the TV manufacturers to understand that users actually want smaller TVs with high-end features. 
So you're seeing like a 40 in, 40 in the range of the 40 inch TVs have all the features like VRR, 4K60, I mean, a 4K 120, AK and stuff like that being introduced into those smaller TVs, which is great as a gamer. I'm, I love that, right? I want to see that. Uh, and I think uh, that is going to force, I think, TV manufacturer or monitor manufacturers to lo lower the prices, right? Because if you look at gaming monitors versus a TV, I mean, the prices are ridiculous. Like, because mm -hmm. sometimes even though you're getting like 10 inches less, right? So um, I think TV manufacturers are now moving into what I call desktop gaming world. Uh, it, although it's still big, right? You're talking about 40 inch TV, but I mean, still, it, it's comparable to your three monitors, if you think about it, right? So um, I think that's great for the future of uh, of uh, consumers and, and and HDMI as a whole. Yeah, man, this this was a a great conversation. <laughs> like, we have to have a follow up, especially when it comes to the gaming stuff. That's yeah, yeah. I'm I, 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 I love I I love what the gaming world is doing right now, um, and it, you know it's it's I'm I'm bummed out about the Olympics, very bummed. But it it does seem like they're gonna be doing it this summer, so um, I guess I'll be watching from home instead of actually being in the crowd <laughs> this this time around. But um, yeah, uh, before we go, um, is there anything else um, that you would like to tell? the audience, like where they can find you, how to stay away from bad cables or fake cables. Um, any, any, any kind of words of wisdom you can give our audience. Yeah. I, I think, uh, most importantly, get anything HMI related, go to HMI.org. Just I, uh, look up the information there before, you know, and having someone tell you that supposedly experts tell them. Right. So, I think that's one thing is always verify your information, anything related to HDMI at HDMI.org. And secondly, always look for that HDMI logo. And if it's a cable, always look for that label. Uh, I, I think that's the best uh, assurance you can have that they went through compliance testing. And, um, and yeah, and just look for the features and you know, look forward to gaming in 2021. I think that's it's just gonna be an exciting year for gamers. For sure, for sure. Um, so. We wanted to say thank you again um, for for joining us on the podcast and uh, for everyone that's listening. If you're listening on you know the podcast side, if you're watching on YouTube side, make sure that you check the description below for all the relative links. We're going to leave the links for HDMI.org in the description, um, as well as make sure that you leave us a comment or a review if you learn something or if you're going to be um, paying closer attention to those stickers on those HDMI cables <laughs> coming forward. So uh, make sure that you leave us those comments or reviews. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, thanks again, Jeff. We truly appreciate you coming out to the show. Um, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people are going to be like, okay, so now I know what to look for when I'm looking for some good cables. Um, but really appreciate it, that, that knowledge. And that's how we continue to lo learn and grow and, and expand our, no our knowledge. So thank you one more time on um, behalf of both of us on Beyond the Streams. And yeah, for everybody else out there listening, make sure you guys do leave us a comment or review. And yeah, with all that being said, you guys stay tuned to the next episode because you never know who's going to be stopping by. So thanks again, and we'll see you guys soon. Peace. Bye.